Welcome to the Flight Club Podcast, a woman's guide to leaning out. We give you a behind-the-scenes look at business launch and growth through the stories of successful female entrepreneurs. Here's your host, Felina Hansen, founder and CEO of Hera Hub. I am so excited to talk to Jessica Hornbeck today. She is founder of Big Picture Results. Her company helps small businesses build financial and workflow systems that grow their profit, their founder's personal income, and of course, all that adds up to freedom for an entrepreneur. She herself has been an entrepreneur many years, uh, over a decade. We'll dive into that in a second and what her uh, takeoff point was, similar to mine. Um, I'll, I'll give a teaser here. It was a layoff. So um, we love the forced entrepreneurship sometimes. Uh, Jessica is also an equity partner to select women and people of color owned growing businesses, a single mother to a firecracker of a little girl, a self defense practitioner and founding member of Elevate San Diego, which is an amazing organization. Maybe we'll talk about Elevate a bit today. She's also a guru at Hera Hub and a volunteer for the Trauma Intervention Program of San Diego. So welcome to the show today, Jessica. Thank you so much, Felina. I'm uh, super excited to share with you and your audience. Yeah, I'm excited to share your story. Um, I don't want to give it away too much. I gave away a little bit here as I as I went through your intro, uh, your taking off point. You've had a couple different businesses, but before we dive into that, take us back. Uh, tell us where you're from. Talk about you know a bit of college years, so to speak, how that yep. informed your career path, and then we'll. We'll get to the point where you you jumped off the cliff like the rest of us and <laughs> took flight as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, so I'm super candid um, about, you know, my background and, you know, what my motivation is to build a life for myself while, you know, inspiring and uplifting others in my community. Um, I come from really humble beginnings. I, um, you know, grew up in the Bronx, raised by my widowed um, abuela, who didn't have more than, you know, a third grade education from Cuba. So I, you know, my circumstances were poverty, we didn't have money, you know, we relied on public assistance, she had to take me in because I was, you know, subjected to a very dysfunctional, abusive, um, sort of household. Um, So there was a lot of struggle, and me really having to keep hope at the forefront of, you know, my mind, um, use that as a guide, think of, you know, um, possibilities, always seeing a bigger picture, a bigger vision for myself. I'm the first to go to college in my family. I realized, you know, early on that I didn't have a lot to rely on. Um, I had nothing to fall back on. And it was sort of a circumstance where I had to make my own life. Um, and, you know, it, it served me really well, you know, my entire life. And we can talk about that um, in a bit to at a certain point, the things that make you successful and, you know, make you who you are at some point, you kind of through the shedding of layers have to leave those qualities behind to embrace um, new transformation. But I've been really fortunate in that difficult, you know, upbringing and circumstances a kid has really made me um, a very self-starter sort of individual, you know, resiliency, I would say is something that has been ingrained in me um, since childhood. And that's allowed me to really recreate um, even the last 12 years that I've been an entrepreneur, you know, I've worn several different hats, I've had several different businesses. And resiliency has always been that, you know, underlying quality. Love it. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about your early career. Um, So you went to New York University, also Manhattan College. Uh, Finance obviously was a focus, econ, entrepreneurship. So you got your MBA from New York University. Um, It looks like a few years later, so we can maybe dance back and forth. Um, But after your undergrad, 
just kind of take us along your career path a bit. You know, how did you start out? Why did you make those choices? Yeah. Um, for me, you know, coming from a place of lack, it all comes down to money. So I started out, it's hysterical, um, my college career as an English and psych major, because these are things that really, you know, appealed to sort of my heart space, you know, my creativity. But I had a wonderful professor in one of my English courses that gave it to me straight. And he's like, hey, if you want to make money when you graduate college, which I needed to because I was there on scholarship and partial loans, you know, and I had to pay my own loans when I graduated. He's like, you're not going to do it being an English teacher or a writer. And, you know, I needed that sort of um, real talk. And I just used it as an opportunity to make a career shift um, while I was in college. And I decided to switch my major, switch schools, um, decided to go after economics and finance. And as soon as I grad, you know, I had something lined up by the time I graduated where I was able to um, line up an internship and that turned into a full-time job opportunity at JP Morgan, um, working on a variety of um, back office operations, financial analysis, and really get my career started in the world of corporate banking. So that's a, you know, I, you went straight into the, the big, the big companies, the big corporate culture. Um, and it looks like it, you, you spent a little time over, actually not a little time, almost six years also in investment banking over at Credit Suisse. Um, what was that like for you? I mean, was that exhilarating? Was it, uh, you know, frustrating at times being in that big corporate culture? Yeah. Um, the things that come to mind, uh, it was definitely an ego boost, right? Coming from, um, you know, circumstance and a household where education wasn't big, you know, knowledge of the world wasn't really huge. I didn't leave my neighborhood in the Bronx until I was 14, until it was time for me to go to high school. So I lived a really sheltered life. I didn't know people that had cars, you know what I mean? Until I went to college. Um, so going into, you know, corporate banking, being surrounded by money, the focus on amassing wealth, on looking a certain part, being professional, being amongst, you know, people that are very, you know, goal driven and um, carry themselves with a certain, you know, caliber of, you know, taste. Um, it was a boost to my ego to be in that sort of environment. Um, I found it really motivating, um, really exhilarating. Yeah, that that word you put out there is definitely it as far as realizing, wow, I can do for myself, I can build this for myself, you know, I was making six figures in my early 20s. Um, I was getting recognized for my ability. It was um, really good from a professional standpoint. I think over, you know, my career at Credit Suisse over that six year period, as I was getting, you know, later on in my 20s, that feeling of motivation and excitement um, kind of got dampered um, after a little while, as I realized I wasn't necessarily fulfilling those things that are personally important to me. Um, I didn't, you know, and I, didn't, I wasn't thinking about this in the beginning, right? Am I contributing to the greater good in some way? And, you know, those wheels really got turning for me, I would say in my later 20s, you know, I moved to Brooklyn from living in Manhattan. I started getting involved in like my local food co-op, volunteering my time there, and really understanding, you know, the greater perspective of helping others, living sustainably, you know, being appreciative and kind to the earth that we live in and understanding that there's a lot more we share with people across classes and, you know, different levels of financial ability. So, you know, the end towards the end of my career, um, upon my layoff, it was a relief because it kind of became a culmination in me realizing, huh, I'm able to amass all this for myself, but it doesn't necessarily feel good. 
Yeah, I, I, I can imagine that that must have been quite a struggle. Um, so let's let's get into the uh, the take flight, and I, I hear some Southern California seagulls behind you. So it's a perfect <laughs> segue to uh, <laughs> to get into our our flight club conversation. Uh, we all can reflect back on 2008, <laughs> right? Yeah, a lot happened, especially in the world of finance and homeownership and mortgage and, and all that. Uh, so it's April 2008. Uh, you are in investment banking. What happened? Yeah, um, I noticed probably, I would say like the last year or two leading up to that, um, as I became, you know, more comfortable in my career and, you know, as comfortable as you can get in your 20s and using your voice and speaking up, there were a lot of things that, you know, as worker bees, you know, we were being told whether we have to digest it or, you know, make it part of our workflow that I didn't necessarily understand and coming up to the financial crisis, you know, there were a lot of things that I wasn't even sure if what I was doing was, you know, correct, or it, 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 they just seemed like a lot of confusion. I raised my hand a lot. And um, it became really clear that they didn't want questions asked, right? I wasn't there for, you know, my personality and outspoken ability and leveraging my voice to question things. I was there to do what I was told. So, you know, the writing started becoming clear on the wall for me in that, damn, like this is probably not a long-term place for me. They're not looking for people like me to, you know, get promoted within the organization. Like they're looking for me to just shut up, get paid and do what I was told. So um, I ended up being the senior most junior person on my team, if that makes sense. Um, So they either had to promote me to a VP level, which was very young for my age, um, but I was capable or divvy up my work across other junior people. And, you know, the financial crisis hit and that's exactly what they did. Um, I got laid off with a really handsome severance package. Um, I realized that day, although it was quite the blow to my overinflated ego at, you know, whatever age 28 I was, you know, like they sent me to London for a year to like improve their processes. So it's like, I thought I was like, hot shit, you know? So all of a sudden to go into work and you're like, Hey, you're not needed here anymore. Um, the ego was definitely the biggest hit for me, but I realized in that moment, I was like, this is it. Like you're at a crossroads. Um, you know, I can decide to continue, right. Hire a recruiter, kind of find myself in that similar space again, or completely start over. And I was young enough um, and bold enough. And, you know, I still have that energy that um, it, it, I embrace the change. I embrace the close on that chapter. Um, you know, I kind of jumped right into entrepreneurship from then. I, you know, I, I, besides the two weeks I took off because I was kind of swallowing my own tongue. I was used to making a certain amount of money. Right. The lifestyle it afforded me was lovely. And I had to make some real changes. So I took a couple weeks off, um, went to Sedona, which I feel like I've mentioned to you before is one of my favorite places for healing and transformation and just regrounding. And I just wanted to get my head on straight and figure out what my next steps were. And your next steps were to open a cafe and lounge <laughs> in Brooklyn. Uh-huh. Uh, I did. A, yeah. My, I remember being on the phone with a lot of my friends, um, you know, in the industry and they're like, well, you know, just hire a recruiter. Like, what are you doing? Like, what? You're crazy. Um, my background all through college, even through high school, um, I've always worked in the restaurant industry. Um, and I I loved it. I was good at it. I really thrive on, you know, fast pace on certain environments. It kind of makes me feel alive. So that was sort of what my gut told me. So yeah, I, you know, went with my gut feeling 100% on this one. Um, I decided to open up a restaurant because, you know, I love the environment. I knew how restaurants worked. Um, and I wanted it to be a source of community, which was really lacking in the neighborhood in which I lived. I did a lot around um, programming for 
local artists, you know, on the wall featuring their art, hosting, you know, live music and just really bringing people together in sort of um, an up and coming area where I lived in downtown Brooklyn, which is now a few blocks from the Barclays Stadium, um, which a lot of us might, you know, know about. Um, and I just went for it. You know, I, in hindsight, I, I went for it a little, um, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed more than I think I would go for something now. But, you know, the fact that I went for it put me in a position of bringing people together, you know, employing some lovely women that I'm still friends with today and also, you know, nailing down in my toolkit that you can sort of do anything you put your mind to and you don't necessarily, don't necessarily have to have all the answers right away. Right. Um, it taught me that you really can figure things out along the way. And I did that for about four years, decided to pull the plug after, you know, I'm putting in 90 hours a week consistently just to break even, right. Like, it went from being such a beautiful dream of mine and it felt really good to serve my community. And we, you know, we did good business, but as you know, you know, restaurants are really hard to run, um, hard to make profitable, even more so in New York city. And I just came to the conclusion that it didn't really feel good in the long run to be working, to not make money. So <laughs> yeah, that's a big, big shift from right? where you were prior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it, it reshaped who I was, right? Like it really put a lot of my value. I went from one extreme to the other um, to un undergo that transformation. But, you know, I never, I'm, I'm a person that I never have regrets for anything. Um, I'm a true believer that everything that's put in your way, the good, the bad, um, is part of your path. And is part of, you know, um, the necessary growth you need to get you to the next step. Um, the beauty of, you know, Linger is the friendships I've made, um, you know, it was my first foray into entrepreneurship, doing something, you know, way sexier than providing financial services. So it was a good intro, but it put me on the path of the business that I have now. Um, I had to teach myself, you know, how to run a business, how to deal with HR issues. I had to teach myself how to do bookkeeping. You know, my background's heavy in finance um, and, you know, analysis, but I, I, I'm not an accountant by trade, but I had to learn how to do my own books, running a restaurant. Um, and, you know, all that sort of kind of, you know, were seeds that I was planting without knowing for the very established successful business we have now. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> so what brought you all the way <laughs> out to San Diego, Jessica? Yeah. So, you know, the, the short answer is a better quality of life. Um, you know, the long answer is I felt a yearning. Um, I visited San Diego during, um, for the first time during that two week hiatus after I got laid off. Um, it really called out to me. Um, I'm someone that follows my intuition and um, after I closed my restaurant, we, you know, my husband at the time and my daughter, um, we had a daughter. Uh, so I realized I have to kind of provide better for her than what I had access to. And there's nothing fun about having a two year old, you know, in a tiny, you know, Brooklyn brownstone, you know, it's cold and it's cold outside, it's snowing, like you're kind of stuck indoors. And it kind of dawned on me like, huh, what about just starting over and going somewhere where the quality of life is different. And um, I start I started uh, bookkeeping then kind of freelance bookkeeping. And I was like, I could do my work anywhere. Um, so I was able to convince, you know, Izzy's dad, and we moved cross country. I love it. I love it. And never looked back, I'm guessing. Nope. It's, uh, <laughs> it's five and a half. It'll be six years now. Um, yeah, I absolutely love it out here. Yeah, it's it's not a bad place to be. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, let's dive into I, I do want to make sure we have a minute to talk about Elevate. Um, maybe we just we just jump into that here real quick so our listeners can learn uh, Absolutely. What, what Elevate is, and then we'll get into your business and know what exactly you do and who you serve. Sure. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, for your listeners, um, Elevate San Diego is an organization that pretty much made the connection for Felina and I. So um, Felina was involved kind of, you know, um, with some of their own programming. It's a global professional women's network. And the mission there is to eliminate the gender gap um, as far as pay and opportunity. So it's really an actionable global organization meant to encourage and support women with intangible and real resources to get our seat at the table. And, um, you know, for those of you who know me and I don't know, you can kind of tell, right, like being a New Yorker from the Bronx, you know, I'm Latina. My, my grandma did not mince words. Um, I think it's really important for women to have a voice for, for everyone, not just women, right? Um, but for women specifically to break the barriers that have been imposed on us through programming, through gender roles, right? These are things that they might be cute to a certain point, but if they're limiting our ability, our opportunity, you know, our self-love, it's not okay. So I think it's super important for those of us that are more comfortable using our voice, right? Um, I'm okay with ruffling a little feathers along the way. It's important for us to, you know, connect and find other women that aren't there yet so that they're able to build something for themselves and in turn pay it forward for, you know, our younger generation. Um, So I got involved with Elevate San Diego as soon as I moved here, probably a few months after I started going, you know, um, to some of their local events. Um, I think there was one event or something. Yeah. Like late that summer. Cause I helped kick, um, formally kick off the actual chapter for San Diego. I was just trying to build a community and find other professional women. Um, I was blown away by, you know, the first sort of informal get together by the sense of camaraderie across the women. And I was really dumbfounded because that's not the way it was in corporate New York, right? Like if you were one of the few women at the table, like, you know, y'all had to fight it out and like, to you know what I mean? Like there wasn't a, you know, support your sister and like, you know, give her props. It was a completely different um, dynamic. And you know, to this day, I can't figure out if it's a matter of the times changing or if it's San Diego. San, you know, West Coast is different than East Coast. Um, But I was embraced by that. And I realized that I could really make an impact. And I became really involved early on. Um, And a few of us sort of got together and formally helped get the chapter off the ground. Yeah, yeah. To your point, Jessica, I, I think, you know, I think it's just it's women in entrepreneurship, right? We, we know once we break the, break the shackles of the corporate culture, right? And we do get, you know, in a room together, um, such a sense of community and support. Um, so I don't know if it's, I don't think it's a San Diego thing. I think Elevate New York probably has, you know, some of the same experience. And I, I think it's a bit ironic, right? When I launched Terra Hub, a woman named Andrea Spari um, launched the 85 Broads chapter, which is formerly Elevate, prior yep. to Elevate was called 85 Broads out of New York, 85 Broad Street, financial, you know, one of the only few women in the room um, as, it, as it goes. So it's definitely great to see the organization grow and flourish and to see your business grow and flourish. So big picture results, uh, walk us through some of the things you do for your clients and the types of clients that you serve. Yeah, Um, so big picture results. We are a financial services firm and our mission is to help growing businesses make more money in less time and put them on a trajectory to truly scale their business so that they can develop more freedom financially and time-wise for themselves and for their um, teams. Uh, The services that we offer um, essentially come back to providing a framework for effective financial and operational management. 
so that the business owner can focus on working on the business, not chasing his own tail, responding to, you know, the daily operations. Um, we do outsourced CFO or chief financial officer services, uh, chief operating officer services. And those essentially talk about getting a framework analy an analytically on the financial end to understand what are the drivers of your business, what could be done to improve coming up with strategic planning, projections, having a conversation around accessing capital. Um, typically that's something we need to grow our businesses exponentially. On the operational end, we really talk about all internal workflows. How are you working with your team? What are those things that are better outsourced? What are we delegating to our teams? How can we document that? set them up for success. Um, we also touch on HR, you know, hiring and onboarding good people, making sure we're putting the right people in the right seats. Um, we also provide, yeah, the bookkeeping services. So that's essentially the practical framework to get us good analysis. So we can set that up. Um, also, you know, train the staff um, on site as needed to continue the day-to-day -day bookkeeping. And we sort of wrap that all up with comprehensive business coaching services where we essentially customize a plan for each of our clients based on their appetite and where they want to take their business. And we hold our clients accountable so that there's progress. Love it. Love it. And yeah. uh, what, give me some examples of the types of companies, either industry or size that you work with. Right. Um, yeah, the majority of um, our businesses are growing. They're profitable, um, you know, several hundred thousand dollars to multi-million dollar companies. Um, as far as industry, we tend to focus primarily on services. Um, and that, you know, spans anywhere from construction and design to advertising companies, um, we have, uh, we work with attorneys. So we really like, um, you know, improving their processes there. And we also cover um, a bunch of clients in the health and wellness spaces. Um, and what makes us really unique, I think, uh, I being a big proponent of supporting women um, and empowering women, um, the majority of our team are, and we're at 11 now, um, bringing on um, two more people in like the next month or so. So you know, we sort of walk the walk where we're a growing organization. Um, I on staff have uh, predominantly, you know, stay at home moms, those that, you know, although things are changed now with the pandemic and working remotely, but, you know, these are women that typically would not have access to working established careers with, you know, good rapport and reputation and um, because they made the decision to put their families first, right? And what I'm finding is that, as you know, women are smart, women are intuitive, you know, we're creative. Um, I, the women on my team, you know, they're able to not only get things done, but do it with that women's touch, you know, that level of intuition and care, which I think is so important in dealing with our clients, because we're talking about something that can be uncomfortable, right? We're talking about your financials, your money. Um, so to have that extra level of care and understanding, as well as ability to push things along where needed with a soft touch, really sets us apart as an organization, especially in, you know, the financial services field, where a lot of these organizations either tend to be, you know, male dominated, or as far as service providers go, really fragmented, right? You'll find bookkeeping companies, and then you have CPA companies that do your tax returns, and then maybe you've got some outsourced consultants. The fact that we have everything under one umbrella, we really are able to drive that value at home by providing a holistic approach, a summary, a game plan, and, you know, holding our clients accountable to what they say they want to achieve further growth. 
Love it. Love it. All right. Well, Jessica, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, they want to learn more uh, about you and your business, where is the best place for them to go? Yes. Um, so check out our website. It is www.bigpickresults. So it's big, B-I-G, P-I-C results.com. You can fill out a contact form that will come to us directly, schedule a 15-minute discovery chat directly off of the website. And if you're not ready to have a conversation, check out the resources page. There's a wealth of information that we continue to update on there. Anything from, you know, some business boosters, presentations where we talk about important topics that can help you make some instant changes on your business. Um as well as, you know, some tips and tricks of the trade. Awesome. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for your time and sharing your story with us. Yes. Thanks so much, Felina. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining this week's episode of Flight Club, sponsored by Hera Hub. We look forward to sharing more success stories with you soon.